Cholesterol is this very important molecule that you need for thinking and memory, you need for your immune system. How we ever got on this boneheaded mission to reduce it to vanishingly low levels that actually create an entire different class of risk factors, how we ever got there is a very interesting story. If there's no benefit to a drug, if it's not going to save your life, why would you sign on for a list of side effects this long? And that's what statins have. There isn't a nutritional element or element of the human body that's more villainized than cholesterol. And so on this episode, we're going to be diving in and really looking at the science behind cholesterol and help once and for all for us to understand this compound and most importantly, what we can do to stack conditions in our favor. Now, the first thing for us to understand is that cholesterol is produced by the human body. All right, it is a compound that is naturally produced by our cells. And to really dive in and talk about what organs, what tissues are most dominant in cholesterol, we need to look upstairs at the human brain. The human brain contains the highest level of cholesterol in our bodies. It contains approximately 20% of our whole body cholesterol and about 80% of that cholesterol in our brains is located within our myelin. Now, if you're wondering what myelin is, myelin is the fatty sheath coating around our nerve axons that facilitate electrical impulse conduction. Now, if you're like, what does that mean? This essentially means that there's this tenet in neuroscience that neurons that fire together, wire together. And so when we're doing a behavior or having a certain thought process, we are going to be making connections between our neurons. And as these connections are happening, they're getting myelinated. They're getting this kind of insulation developed over them that make that nerve firing more protected, more automatic, and faster. And so this is why, for example, we can start to do things on autopilot. They can be automated behaviors because we've laid down a lot of myelin so that that nerve firing, that pathway, is really stable, strong. And I like to think of things like Steph Curry shooting a basketball or for any of us driving. Like when we started the first time we got into a car behind the wheel versus where you know, today, unfortunately, a lot of people are, you know, they're eating, you know, messing with their phone, all this stuff. Not saying that it's safe, but they're able to kind of automate some of the parts of driving and still be able to operate the motor vehicle. Whereas before we're on hyper alert and being aware of the environment. All right. So not advocating that you drive eating a box of macaroni and cheese and you know watching youtube videos i'm not advocating for that but the fact that we can automate behaviors is something that all of us experience but we don't really acknowledge that that is going on and we have myelin to thank for that that we can automate certain things and even just thinking about driving in a safe context just being able to drive and like listen to a podcast or your attention can be on other things other than just the environment around you because that nerve firing has been automated and so, again, myelin is this fatty sheath coating around our nerve axons that facilitate electrical impulse conduction, and 80% of the cholesterol in our brain is used to make that myelin. It is that important. Now, myelin is absolutely a primary aspect of cholesterol in our bodies, but let's dive a little bit deeper because, again, the brain produces its own own cholesterol all right this isn't just a nutritional intake thing our brain cells specialized brain cells actually make this cholesterol that we're talking about it's believed that astrocytes in the human brain produce most of the brain's cholesterol now the reason that these are called astrocytes which is a really cool name is that these are star-shaped cells of the central nervous system and they're a subtype of our glial cells. Astrocytes actually outnumber our neurons by over five fold in our brains. All right, so our glorified brain cells, our neurons, astrocytes, we have five fold more in our brains. In humans, a single astrocyte cell can interact with up to two million synapses at a time. 
So there's really like this solar system going on in our brain. Now, a tremendous amount of cholesterol is synthesized in our brain within the first few weeks of our birth. And disruptions to this process can lead to neurodegenerative disorders. We're getting cholesterol from breast milk in our early stages of life, especially in those first couple of weeks. The cholesterol, the saturated fat content in human breast milk is very high and it is vital to the development of our brains. Again, these things that are unfortunately vilified in our culture, it's kind of dirty words. We got a dirty S word, that's saturated fat. Got a dirty C word. You know a dirty C word, don't you? Cholesterol, that's what I'm talking about, all right? Now again, this absorption of cholesterol and the production of cholesterol in the brain, again, we need the building blocks. This is where saturated fat even comes into play to be building blocks for our brain cells, our astrocytes to make cholesterol in the brain itself. We've gotta really understand that the lack of these things is one of the things that's emerging, dramatically increasing our risk of neurodegenerative disorders and challenges with our mental health as well. Cholesterol plays an important role in nerve regeneration after being injured as well. This is so important, so important, whether it's our brain cells, our cardiovascular system. Cholesterol plays an important role in regenerating tissues. This is the reason that it's getting shuttled throughout our bodies. We got little carriers, little cars that take it. All right. One of those cars is called low density lipoprotein. It's a car. All right. It's not cholesterol itself. It's a car. It's a it's a Uber for your cholesterol to get delivered where it needs to go. But sometimes the car gets blamed when there's a backup, when there's traffic. The car gets blamed. It's all these cars and people don't understand that there could be something down. There could be a power line down somewhere on the road in a place that you can't see it. But because the cars are there, that's where unfortunately science has been pointed and blaming the cars. Now, to move on again, we're going to really unpack this and you're gonna also get to hear from one of the leading experts in the world on this subject matter to really understand how do we get to this place where we're blaming the cars instead of what's causing the backup in the first place because the cars are delivering something vital to healing in the first place. And cholesterol, again, it's a core ingredient for our health, for our brain health in particular. That's what we're starting off talking about. Now, with cholesterol being this dirty C word and being something that is so vilified in modern medicine, we have this multi, multi, multi massive industry of statins. All right, so these are cholesterol lowering drugs. And they've been some of the biggest, most successful, not as far as disease remission or quote, curing any conditions because heart disease, heart attacks, all that stuff has just kept going up. Not to nullify those things, but I'm talking about successful as monetarily for pharmaceutical companies coming in with a blunt instrument in the form of statins, is that affecting our brains? That's the question. And now to look at some of the data on this, in a meta-analysis that was a collaborative effort by researchers at Harvard and Yale, titled Loss of Astrocyte Cholesterol Synthesis Disrupts Neuronal Function and Alters Whole Body Metabolism. The researchers reported sporadic short-term memory loss associated with statin drug use, which prompted the FDA to put a warning on the drug class. I bet you didn't know that. A lot of people are not informed about this, that the FDA has a warning on statin drugs that this could cause memory loss. No big deal. You'll forget anyways. No big deal. That's the situation that we're dealing with. Again, we're looking at something coming in as a blunt instrument. We gotta get rid of cholesterol. We gotta lower cholesterol. Not understanding what is the whole body implication here. And so this is just one of the unfortunate side effects is degradation of our brains and our memory. And just to give you a little bit of a heads up 
on just one of the other things that cholesterol is responsible for is for building your sex hormones, all right? You're not going to be making your sex hormones that it's, this isn't just about sex. This is about, this is about our body composition. This is about our cognitive function. This is about the health of our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, our digestion is affected by our sex hormones as well. Our skin health, there isn't a part about you. There isn't an aspect of your health that is not affected by your sex hormones. And so we, we don't want to put in that pithy box, that little box. Shout out to the box for talking about sex. But we don't want to put it in a pithy box and miss out on the fact that our sex hormones are critical for our vitality. And so cholesterol is a core ingredient. It is a seed of building our sex hormones. What happens when we come in with a blunt instrument to lower cholesterol, is that gonna affect our sexual function and all of the other offshoots? And also how our sex hormones influence things like our metabolic health and insulin sensitivity and things like that. So these are all things that we're going to unpack for you today. So I'm very, very excited to be able to share this with you. I wanted to put this together because unfortunately, there are still, this is one of the top 20 drugs worldwide, just raking in, it's a cash cow, and they're still, they're milking it. There was a time when statins were like t t top of the list. All right, they were the hottest thing on the streets. But there's been a dent put into the system because more information has been coming out like this. And I, I'm grateful for platforms like this and for people like you to take this information and to make change and to stand up for ourselves and for our families and say we will not accept this shoddy science at our expense and damage ourselves in order to put money in the pockets of entities that are profiting from our sickness, that are profiting from our ignorance. And so again, we're making the dent here, but there's still a lot of people, unfortunately, that see cholesterol as this bad thing, it's the dirty C word, and they wanna get rid of it. They wanna get the cholesterol down in order for them to be healthy. And so I'm really grateful to be able to put this together for you. And by the way, before we get to our expert, keep in mind, there are other dirty words <laughs> in nutritional circles that have been unfortunately and not really based on science, but on conjecture. And another one of those, it's another dirty S word, is salt, all right? Another nutritional necessity that humans have been valuing for thousands of years. The word salt is derived from a root word meaning salary, right? People getting paid with salt, so valuable, right? You find if there's a salt source or salt lick in nature, the animals are all over it. You know those goats that be standing up on the side of the those cliffs? And they're like sideways. It's just like those goats are, you know, they're like almost climbing vertically. Why are they doing it? They're trying to get a lick of some salt. That's what they're trying to do. That's why they're doing it. Crazy goats. All right. We value the goats. All right. We talk, we have goat conversations all the time. All right. Jordan, Kobe, LeBron. What about the real goats? Why are they doing what they're doing? They're trying to lick that salt. Now, with that being said, being that salt has been valued for thousands of years by humans, why has it been villainized recently? Is this based on sound data? Now, this is the most definitive, comprehensive assessment of salt in the human diet. This was a meta-analysis of a massive amount of studies published in the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. This is the most coveted of all peer-reviewed databases. All right, this is where the researcher is researching. All right, this is where the scientist is looking for the data. They uncovered that study participants placed on a low sodium diet did have slightly lower blood pressure in the short term. So when they say, you know, cut the salt, short term. But that restricted sodium 
also led to elevated triglycerides. Problem. Elevated stress hormones. Problem. And, accordingly, elevated blood pressure. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. All right? We're doing something. Again, blunt instrument. Lower the sodium. Blood pressure goes down a little bit short term, but ends up going up in the long term because we're missing the point. And also the danger here, the hazard with having these elevated triglycerides, that's another one of those recipes when we talked earlier about it not being the cars, but being something down the road that can be blocking and causing a backup. Triglycerides, elevated triglycerides are one of those things that can create a traffic jam. All right, now, another study, this was conducted by researchers at Harvard Medical School and published in the journal Metabolism found that a low salt intake directly increases insulin resistance in healthy test subjects and healthy people creating insulin resistance when we're not getting in enough salt. That is so counter to the narrative out there about salt. Now, what is true is that most people are consuming an abnormal amount of salt, highly processed, denatured salt in ultra processed foods. That's where the average American is getting upwards of 80, 70, upwards of 80% of the salt intake is coming from ultra processed foods. All right. Low quality, number one, and all of these Synthetic chemicals coming along, creating a chemical soup of problems. Is the problem really the salt? According to the data, no. Could it be where we're getting the salt from? Now, why does this matter? Because sodium in particular, and by the way, that's not the only form of salt. All right. We tend to use this synonymously with sodium, but there's magnesium salts, potassium salts, Calcium salts, these are all in the category of electrolytes. These are all minerals that carry an electric charge. Without these salts, your cells can't work. Without these salts, your cells cannot talk to each other. They can't send data. They can't send these electrical messages and run you. You become like the Tin Man on Wizard of Oz. All right? Shout out to the Wizard of Oz and shout out to the Wiz. All right, shout out to those that know about The Wiz, starring Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, part of my childhood, man. I remember, I mean, it had been out for a while, but I remember my, my Auntie Janet put it on for me and it was just like, Michael Jackson was a scarecrow? Wow, it's crazy. Anyways, you become like the Tin Man. You start to be in a situation where your body cannot function. And that oil that the Tin Man was looking for, for us, electrolytes. Take sodium, for example. Not only does this electrolyte help to maintain proper water balance in your cells and in your brain, a study conducted by researchers at McGill University found that sodium functions as a, quote, on-off switch in the brain for specific neurotransmitters that support optimal function and protect the brain against numerous diseases like neuropathic pain and epilepsy. Also, another one of these salts in a double-blind, placebo-controlled study published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease found that improving magnesium levels in adult test subjects, these were folks between the ages of 50 and 70, could potentially reverse brain aging by over nine years. Younger brains by getting in these key electrolytes. Of course, you want to target electrolyte-rich foods. And also, for me, today, even before the show, getting a high-quality, intelligently-sourced electrolyte without unnecessary sugar, without artificial colors, just high quality electrolytes. And the electrolytes that I use is from Element. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash model. And not only are you going to get the most science-backed electrolytes in the world, you're going to get a free gift with every purchase of electrolytes. All right, they're going to send you a bonus gift. All right, so head over there, check them out. It's drinklmnt.com forward slash model. This is in my house all the time. At all times, I travel with Element now. It's one of those things that, again, if, you, if you've done this for a while and traveling, that kind of stuff, taking flights, you really notice a difference when you get your electrolytes in and process like that. It's a very stressful process for the body in general, but also the fact that being up in 
a plane, you know, there's different altitudes and the pressurized cabin and all this stuff. It is just evaporating. It's pulling so much moisture from your cells. And so getting those electrolytes help to hydrate your cells as well. That's a part that's overlooked oftentimes, unfortunately. But huge fan of Element. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash model. And now let's get to our incredible special guest and somebody that I've had multiple conversations with. He's truly a hero and mentor in this field. He is in his mid 70s. And just today, I just got an invite for his wedding. He in his mid 70s out here. He's getting busy. He's doing his thing. He is a lightning rod. He is a Literally, when our conversations, if you see him here in the studio, we almost have to strap him down to the chair because he's bou- he's bouncing. All right, he's a bouncy guy. All right, he's just full of energy, full of life. He's playing tennis every day, you know. But he, he attributes so much of this, obviously, yes, at, to the to the exercise uh, regimen that he has, but mainly to his nutrition. And he's a walking, talking representation of what's possible. Super inspiring. And I'm talking about none other than Dr. Johnny Bowden. But cholesterol is this very important molecule that you need for thinking and memory, that you need for your immune system, that you need to make your hormones, and that you need to make vitamin D. Mm. It's a parent molecule for all those things. <clears throat> when I used to do these things in person and do lectures and stuff, there was, used to be an old commercial that showed, this is your brain on drugs with the... I would go, this is your brain with cholesterol, looks great, like a balloon, and then you prick it. That's what your brain looks like without cholesterol, you're mm. dead. Mm. So it is a vitally important molecule. How we ever got on this boneheaded mission to reduce it to vanishingly low levels that actually create an entire different class of risk factors, how we ever got there is a very interesting story. It's been told by me, it's been told by Nina Teichloff in her book, The Big Fat Lie. The history of how we got into this insane position uh, has been told many times and we can go over it, but it's wrong. And people are just going on, doing it the usual way, measuring cholesterol in an antiquated way, good and bad, it's just 1960s nonsense, and then prescribing very strong drugs based on the results of an ineffective test looking for a market that really doesn't really cause heart disease in the first place. I think it's really important for everybody to understand because it's so pervasive in our culture that cholesterol is this really big villain causing heart disease. Where did this idea originate? Where did all this come from? So the history of this is that um, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a research physiologist named Ansel Keys and... uh, Around that time, and the, the context is important because we had a president at that time, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Republican president, who the, you, people who were born like after 19, you can't even imagine a bipartisan kind of country where everyone loved Eisenhower. He was a beloved guy. He had been a hero as a general. He was a kind man. He was just a good guy, and everyone liked him. There was no anti, you know, mm-hmm. and he had a heart attack in office. And the country went, what? They, heart attacks, 1950s, 1960s, you know, the profession of cardiology didn't exist before the early part of the 20th century. It's not like everyone knew about heart disease. And here's this guy, he's a general. He's, now, he did smoke. There were other things. We didn't know all about that stuff then. Um, and he has a heart attack, and people were frantic. Think the COVID thing. It's like, what do we do? Are people in danger? And all of a sudden, there was a lot of emphasis on heart disease and looking at the statistics, and they're finding out that young men are coming back from the war, and they have plaque in their arteries. We've got an epidemic of heart disease on our hands, ladies and gentlemen. What are we going to do? And the demand for answers, much like with COVID, exceeded the science. We don't have time to figure this out. What do you think we should do? And into that abyss walks this guy, Ansel Keys. He's a physiologist. He's not an MD. He's not a nutritionist. He's a physiologist. He was very prestigious and very powerful. And he had a theory. And his theory was based on the fact that he and his wife went to Italy, and all these people looked so healthy. And there was the sunshine, and he was just completely entranced with this and thought there was something about the diet of these people that makes them so healthy and lovable, and, and, and we're falling apart here in America, and they don't have heart disease. I know, these people don't eat any saturated fat. 
and your cholesterol. That's, he had that theory. He didn't have evidence for it, but he believed it. And as we've all learned, a, a politician or a, a public personality with power, determination, and being convinced they're right can influence a lot of things. So Ansel Keys goes to the World Health Organization. He has a chart. And he says, look at this. I've got proof. You look at all these countries. Heart disease goes down. The less fat they eat, the, more heart, uh, the less heart disease they have. Look at Japan. And the more fat they eat, look at the United States, the more heart disease. Clearly, it's fat and cholesterol. And the, the World Health Organization kind of laughed at him because the data was, <laughs> was the equivalent of like a check. It was a correlation thing, and he left out all the countries that didn't agree with that hypothesis. So there were like 22 countries that they had data for as far as you know, how much fat they ate and how much cholesterol. And, and he just picked the six that showed that straight line. Mm -hmm. Um, they kind of laughed at him. He, was, he didn't take kindly to that. This has all been documented because people were there, at their, still were alive, they're in the 90s now, but they've all said, yeah, Ansel, he didn't like to be criticized. He didn't like to be laughed at. So he designs a study called the Seven Countries Study. That is the basis of our dietary advice for the past 60 years. And the Seven Countries Study was a designed study that looked at seven countries and their dietary patterns and their levels of heart disease. And he was able, by con convoluting that data and picking just those countries, to show what looked like a fairly clear relationship between how much fat people ate and how much heart disease they, they actually had. This study has not only been quoted and, and used more than any other study in nutrition, but it's also been reanalyzed. And I don't even think it could get published today. It's that bad. One of his samples was done during Lent when people weren't eating. I mean, how is that mm. representative of anything? They did not look at stress. They did not look at patterns of eating. They did not look at micro. They didn't know anything about that. It was simply an observational study. And what he did, and it's been shown a million times, he said, well, how come he left these people out? He left out anything that did not fit the hypothesis. But he had a massive published study. He was a prestigious researcher. And he got this on the basis of this. With a lot of controversy, he got the guidelines that reflected that accepted as the dietary guidelines. So we should eat less fat because we know it causes heart disease. Again, there were other people saying there's no science. And so you observed a bunch of people and their eating habits. It's the, you may have published it and it looks very impressive and you've got a lot of people working on it. But it's an observational study that you didn't control for 30 different variables. Didn't matter. It got in there. And it became the basis of the consensus committee in the 80s. And they said, this is what we're going to recommend. People don't eat saturated fat. And they don't eat cholesterol. And everything will be fine. And the research since then has shown that that's the biggest crock of you know what in the world. This and we're story, still living with this This story. is so fascinating. We are still living so with those much recommendations. Here. We're, we're seeing these same patterns of behavior going on today. Yes. Very similar. Yeah. So first thing. With with Ansel Keys doing this work, number one, we've got to talk about the fact that so much of our nutrition advice is based on observational data. Oh, Can you talk a little bit about it's my that? Because subject, I'm, I'm actually <laughs> giving a talk at Whole Foods next next week. Uh, okay. At, about nutrition mythology, and one of the things I'm going to address is why you can't believe anything about nutrition research. So, sadly, almost every recommendation you hear. Whether, you, whether it's the good stuff we agree with, like you should eat a lot of nuts and blueberries, even stuff like that, or the stuff like green tea causes a, a cancer and causes cancer, or whatever, whatever ingredient to the moment they think, it, those are based on what's called observational or epidemiological studies, which we call the redheaded stepsister of scientific research. So an observational study is when you watch it, you don't do anything. You don't intervene. You don't like take this group and give them this drug and then this group gets a placebo and then you met. It's not that. It's the opposite of that. It's like you go into a community and you ask the people, what do you guys eat? And you make a chart and you compare some things and you look at the end results and how many of them actually you know, are, are, get sick with a given endpoint. And you make some hypotheses. Right. It looks like there's more lung cancer among the people who smoke. Let's investigate that hypothesis. 
could be that the people who smoke are also eating some kind of horrible carcinogen, and that's what's really causing the cancer. We don't know. We need to do a test. But it sure looks like smoking is related to lung cancer. What we did with this stuff is they observed things like Ansel Keys did. They didn't test it. They didn't do clinical studies on it. They didn't say, let's take one group and feed them saturated fat and one group and feed them vegetable oil. Let's see what happens. Let's keep it a controlled experience. Nobody did that. All they did was, it looks to us, it looked to Ansel Keys and Walt Willett from Harvard and the other people who bought into this, it looks like the Italians are really, and that's the Mediterranean diet, and that's, which, which is another myth, because there's 22 countries in the Mediterranean, folks, they don't all eat the same diet. Mm. It's another created myth that we all, they all eat olive oil and no meat and all that stuff, which isn't true. But the point is, it was observational. And Observational studies are meant, like I said, to suggest a hypothesis that sounds reasonable that you can then get funding for and do a clinical test to see if it's true. Nobody did that. And in fact, it's come out that there were little pockets where they actually did something like that when they tested the saturated versus the unsaturated. The people with, who ate all the vegetable oil and the margarine actually had higher rates of heart disease. So anytime that they actually tested it, it turned out to be wrong. What I want to ask you about is with that observational data, there was a massive change in the way that the public perceived food. And we went to war with fat. We went to war with dietary we fat. Did. So can you talk about the implication? What, what did that lead oh, to? What happened God. in our society? And also talk about, in your book you mentioned, there's a, there's a sidebar, which is a great story about the snack well phenomenon. Oh, yeah. Well, anyone who was around for that low-fat madness back in the 80s and, and early 90s, when I started my career as a personal trainer, we were all into low-fat. That was the thing. And Snackwell was this horrible junk food cookie that had managed to take all the fat out. And, and nobody was looking at sugar then. So here you had, you had the, 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 the poster child, the Wikipedia poster child for like low-fat crap food that was like, nonetheless, it didn't have any fat in it, and that was the standard by which we judge it. So the snack wall phenomenon was, here's a piece of absolute junk food laden with sugar and starch and chemicals, but it meets the standard of not having fat. And, that's, and half the foods in the grocery store are like that now. Yeah, They were throwing that label on there like crazy. This is when marketers and the media jump on things as well and take science that, again, is a hypothesis and turn it into apparent truth in the public's eyes. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So, uh, so what happened when we shifted over from removing fat from food and replacing that with what? <laughs> well, we're replacing it with sugar and with starch. I mean, food tastes horrible when there's no food, when there's no um, fat in it. And, and the only way they could make it edible was to, to sweeten it profusely with all kinds of stuff. And we wound up eating very high carb diets, which is what was recommended to us by every food pyramid. Even the my plate version, they're all the same crap. It's always high in carbs. And there's a reason for that too, which I would love to talk about that a lot of people don't know. But that's what's been recommended to us. And what happened, you ask what happened in those 50 years, we got fat, sick, tired and depressed as a nation. And we have a new term called diabesity, which we didn't have before because diabetes, obesity, Actually, as I say in the book, heart disease, Alzheimer's, one long continuum, um, all came from this insane diet that was never even close to what the human genus was set up to run on. This was published in the peer-reviewed journal, Current Opinions in Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Obesity. And the title of the study is, Statin Therapy is Not Warranted for a Person with High LDL Cholesterol on a Low Carbohydrate diet. Can you unpack this study? Oh, I'd be share? so happy to unpack this. Um, that study was written by David Diamond, who uh, we should know is, is really a highly respected researcher. And in preparation for this, I decided to review some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be up on this. I wanted to give you the best information. So I went back to my actual book, Living Low Carb, from 2004, which is now in the fourth edition, and has a very good explanation of how this works. And I realized that back in the 90s, I was quoting research showing that this, the healthiest older people had three measures. This is 1992 research. They had low triglycerides, high HDL, and low fasting insulin. Those are the people who lived the longest, were the healthiest, stayed out of the hospital. 
Okay? So we have known about this ratio number since the 1990s. Yeah. Okay? So what David Diamond did is he said, let's see what happens to the people who have a good ratio, a, a low triglycerides, high HDL, but they happen to have LDL. Mm -hmm. And we'll put them all on statin. Well, guess what happened? The people who had that low ratio that I've been preaching about for 15 years, nothing, no benefit, zero benefit to taking a statin. People who were unhealthy, they benefited slightly from the statin. But not because it lowered their LDL, because it, it took care of that ratio. That ratio is so much more predictive than LDL ever was. And David Diamond's new study shows it. So the conclusion was, if you've got LDL, but you're healthy, meaning you have low triglycerides and high HDL, you will not benefit from a statin drug. Mm. That's what now, that... Th and of course, now, right off the bat, that goes against the narrative from the statin industry, which is a multi, multi-billion dollar cash cow billion, at this point. Actually. And just to share this little snippet, you know, again, I want to preface this by you've been talking about this. This is just a, the newest oh, it's in not many just studies. Me. I'm, I'm not, I won't take that. I mean, there's a bunch of people who have been sounding the you've alarm been on this. You've one of the world. foremost voices in this, you know. And, you know, this is another study that's affirming what you've been trying to teach us. And so this particular, and this was a meta-analysis that he did, looking at a ton of different right. studies. That's when they look at tons of studies and they see what can be gleaned from looking at them as a whole. And this included a variety of placebo-controlled studies mm -hmm. in this particular meta-analysis that he did. And he found that LDL alone was, quote, a very weak association with heart disease exactly. and stroke. Exactly. Like, come on, like this is, but this is the thing that you, you look for in a conventional mindset, conventional panel, LDL's high, let's put you on a statin. And also, it's he 1963 mentioned- 1963 medicine. Yeah, and, and furthering that, he said that, again, as you already stated, optimal triglycerides and HDL That's taking- That's the numbers to look at, folks, and, and here's what's good about that. We're gonna get into this. There's a better cholesterol test than good and bad. Yeah. It's hard to get your doctor to order it. We'll talk about it in a second, but the point is you don't have to order a special test to get out what your ratio is. You have it in your hands. If you've ever had a blood test, you know your triglycerides, you know your HDL, do the division. It is really easy. Yeah. And yeah. that's available to everyone. Your doctor doesn't have to agree or not agree, doesn't have to, they don't have to you know, order a special test. It's right there. Now here's the other part of this is that, as you mentioned, taking a statin provided no benefit for folks who, even who if were, they had high LDL, correct. they had optimal triglycerides and HDL. Now, the other side of the equation, which he referenced here, is indicating the potential downside and adverse effects by putting folks on a statin who really, really don't need a statin. And this included development of diabetes, damage to the muscles and kidneys, and impaired brain function. Oh, I guess we're going to get into all Absolutely, of oh, we, we got, got to. We got some, We've got some to. show and tell stuff for that. Yeah. So, this is the point. You and I, if we had a life-threatening disease and they said to us, look, we've got this drug. You got a good chance of saving your life, but it comes with a lot of side effects. And you go, I've got a good chance of having my life saved. I'll take the side effects. If there's no benefit to a drug, if it's not going to save your life, if it's not going to extend your life, if it's not even going to be useful in your particular case, why would you sign on for a list of side effects this long? And that's what statins have. Remember, it, this is not anti-statin. It's anti-statin overuse that we're standing for. I mean, we got criticized a lot with the great cholesterol myth. Oh, they're anti-statin. No, we're anti the medical industrial complex that keeps trying to extend the market for their product. That statin drug was developed for middle-aged men who had previously had a heart attack. Now, please understand this. That is called, that's called secondary prevention. We are trying to prevent you from having a second heart attack. That's secondary. You've already had one. We think this drug will reduce the risk slightly of you having a second. That's what it was developed for. That's what the original research showed. A mild benefit it was not an overwhelming benefit. You could get that benefit with a few lifestyle changes, which we'll talk about. But it did show some. Yeah. It showed none in children. It showed none in older, uh, older people. Zero in people over 75. Wasn't even tested on women. This is all relatively recent where they're trying to expand the market for it. 
And now you have doctors saying, "Let's, Mrs. Jones, let's get your 13 year old on a statin drug because he's got some high cholesterol there, and we got to, you know, cut this off at the pass." So, it's the putting the statins in the water supply mentality that I am so incensed about because you are talking about a drug that has sexual side effects, and I'm sure we'll get into that. That gets everybody's attention. Memory side effects, pain, myopathy, memory loss. There's a lot of side effects, and you and I would take the chance if it was going to save us from stage four cancer. But this doesn't save us from that, and in many cases, this drug is being prescribed with no indication that it's going to do any benefit. Let's talk specifically about this extending our lifespan, because just in talking with you, it sparked a Good. question in my mind. So I went and looked this down. up. I so love when, questions. And on this episode, everybody who's listening to the audio version, it'd be a good idea to pop over to YouTube. We're going to put a lot of studies up on the screen for you. This was published in the BMJ, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. Let me guess. So and hard this okay. one is titled, The Effect of Statins on Average Survival in Randomized Controlled Trials and Analysis of Endpoint Postponement. So it's looking at how statins can possibly extend your life. Now, this meta-analysis, they did a great job of really zeroing in on people who qualify in their analysis, and it, it included about 92,000 patients, which is a robust data set. Yes. Here's what the study found. The study found that statin use was shown to prolong life between minus five days and 19 days. Minus five days and 19 days. In That's other primary. Words, there's no major effect whatsoever. Right. On and we're time. talking days here, but also, again, some of them found that you're going to lose five days. In secondary prevention trials, which is what you talked about, trying to prevent a second heart attack, from life people. was prolonged between minus 10 days and 27 days for all the potential side effects that you're going to have, losing quality of life itself and barely, if at all, and possibly even reducing your lifespan when you actually look at the real numbers. Something is not adding up here. Something isn't adding up at all. And I would argue that if we paid for our own medications, if we were if it wasn't just, well, insurance pays for it, and we had to actually do a cost-benefit analysis and say, I'm paying that much, even $30, $40, $50 dollars a month for this drug, and what, what were those statistics again, Sean? When I, I might get five extra days if I take this for the next 10 years, and I'm gonna have these side effects? I don't think I'm gonna buy that medicine. But now, insurance pays for it, everybody just takes it because the doctor says to take it. And I'm telling you, I play, you know, I'm an avid tennis player and I play with people literally 14 to 89. So there's a lot of old people in that group and there are a lot of men that are on statin drugs that don't need to be. And they come in and they go, man, I've had such muscle pain since I got on that Questor. The doctor says it's not that. I've had such memory loss since I started that, but my doctor says I'm just getting older. It's mild cognitive impairment. They don't need to be. And I see the symptoms every single day. Yeah, yeah. Let's dig in and talk about this because with even within Dr. David Diamond's study, he mentioned, this is a direct quote, certain statins have been linked to cognitive impairment because oh, yeah. they interfere with the brain's ability to produce cholesterol, which is essential for the creation of new brain connects, connections and to form memories. Memory, thinking, everything is affected. Cholesterol is needed in the brain. I, I, I have been apoplectic on podcasts and interviews when I talked about these doctors who are trying to put 13 year olds on statin drugs. Your kid's cerebral cortex doesn't come online till he's 25. That's, that's the executive function. It's not even physically developed till you're 25. To put a kid on statins where cholesterol won't be manufactured in the brain where it's needed for cell membranes, for thinking, for memory, is such malpractice that these, uh, they should be dis just taken, <laughs> their license should be taken away. Yeah. It's not always their fault because they've been so well marketed. Yeah. These companies are so good at marketing. You know, I, I heard this wonderful analogy for the American medical system. You got this cliff and pe it's a notorious traffic thing and people fall off the cliff constantly. And what you got is a great system of ambulances and they literally wait there at the bottom of the cliff and they're shiny and they're new and they got all the stuff and they whisk you off to the hospital and they, they can put people back together after falling off this cliff. Mm -hmm. That's our medical system. Nobody is talking about putting guardrails on the top of the cliff. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody is talking about that. It's not covered by insurance. We could put some guardrails up there, and guess what? People stop falling off there, and then that whole system isn't quite as necessary. Yet all of our focus in medicine in America, all the things you hear about, oh, we have the best medical, we have the best sick care in the yeah. world. We have the ability to find the best sick care. If you, if I'm in, uh, in a, God forbid, a traffic accident, I want to go to Cedar sinai That's, you know, I'm not going to an herbalist. But we have zero ability to prevent these diseases, this epidemic of what we call diabetes, because diabetes and obesity are joined like a horse and carriage. Yeah. And we have no ability to treat that or to get treatments that are covered by insurance. They just don't exist. We, what we do is we get better ambulances to take them to better places to keep them functioning. So, Dr. Johnny Bowden here today, are you saying that we have a Humpty Dumpty <laughs> medical system? We, we have a very frightening medical industrial system in which the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies control most of what happens in our health care. And it's in the wrong hands. Yeah. You know, I, I, we were talking earlier, we, we're probably going to bounce around a lot like this, but we talked earlier and we mentioned that there is a better test for cholesterol. It's existed for 15 years. Uh, it looks at, you see, when, when, let's go back and look at how we got into the insane notion of good and bad cholesterol to begin with. So in the beginning, you know, when I was a tiny little kid, they had health fairs, and they, people were just getting aware of what cholesterol was. They thought it was, you know, a big part of heart disease, and there was an, a, a public campaign to get yourself tested, and they would have these health fairs where you, you'd learn about things like fitness, going to the gym, getting your cholesterol tested, and there'd be a little booth there, and, and the doctor would do a little blood prick, you know, for you and put it on a clock. Oh, Mrs. Jones, your cholesterol is 235. That's very good because in those days, 240 was considered the norm. Uh, and they'd give you a single number. As the years went on and microscopes got better and technology got better, they realized, well, actually, cholesterol doesn't travel in the blood. It can't. It, it's hydrophobic. It doesn't mix with water. It has to travel in a container. Mm -hmm. The container is the lipoprotein. So LDL, that second L stands for lipoprotein. And HDL, the second L stands for lipo. Those are the containers. Cholesterol are in the containers. So they realize these containers are kind of different. The HDL one looks a little differently. It has a higher density. It floats to the bottom of a liquid if you look at it in a microscope. The low density ones, they, they have a different you know weight. And so we decided to kind of classify them not just as total cholesterol, but HDL and LDL, and through very mystical kind of like looking at things from, uh, they thought the HDL kind of does better things and the LDL kind of doesn't. So let's call the LDL bad and let's call the HDL good. So this is 1963 thinking. Yeah. First of all, it's the same cholesterol. It's like a passenger on a train. You're on a different train, but you're the same guy. So cholesterol is not different when it's carried in an HDL or an LDL. It's the same cholesterol. That's number one. Number two, and I guess the best way to explain this, this carrier versus cargo thing, if you've got trucks carrying cargo going down the roads and you're trying to prevent traffic accidents, what's the thing you want to know? How many trucks are on the road? Do you care how many boxes of Kleenex they're bringing to Walmart? Do you care what the cargo is? Or, you know, they're transporting beer. Well, how many beers are in there? We don't care about the cargo. We want to know how many trucks are coming down this highway because that's what's crashing into each other, right? Those are, and we want to know also what's the size of the trucks. A little minivan, less damage than an 18-wheeler rolling down the thing. So we need to know size. We need to know amount. That's what the new cholesterol tests. They look at the lipoproteins, not the cargo, not the cholesterol that they're carrying, but the actual number of lipoproteins, because that's what crowds up the bloodstream. If you've got tons of them, they're more likely to bump into each other. There's more likely to be accidents. And we have a test now called LDLP for particle, for the number of lipoproteins. That is a valuable piece of information. That does predict events. Doctors won't order the test. They stick with the LDL and HDL. This goes back to tie in something very important here, which is 
how this system is constructed to where these tests, even if a doctor would have the audacity to do this, is it going to get it covered by insurance? I'm so glad you brought that up because that was my next thing. I used to go on these podcasts and, and I would get visibly, shakingly angry at the doctors that won't order these tests. How can they be so stupid? How can they be so stuck in 1960s medicine to not know that we now know that LDL comes in big sizes, little sizes, intermediate sizes, thousands of particles, hundreds of particles, that, you, that information is there? How can they not order that? How can they not know that? And then... As I learned more about how the pharmaceutical industry works, I realized it's not them at all. It's the insurance companies. Because here's what happens. And, and whistleblowers, this is in freedom of information documents. You can, I can give you references for where you can hear people speak about this who have been in this industry. The doctor orders the test. The insurance company says, why are you ordering this more expensive test? They don't need this. And he says, well, yes, they do, because blah, 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 blah. If you continue to order these tests, they say, your contract will be reevaluated. The doctor thinks to himself, I'm going to lose Blue Shield? No, thanks. And they, they will not order it, even if they believe it to be true. So there's two issues. One is, they don't even know that you need that test. And two is, if they do need it, they do know you need it, they're not able to order it. Yeah. Or they'll, it, they'll a, lose their business potential. They will lose, the, if, if Blue Shield walks out, because you just, it's like insurance. It's like if you put too many claims in on your car, they drop you. Yeah. Well, health insurance, if the doctor puts in too many requests for tests that aren't covered, or they don't want to cover, or they're a little more expensive, they won't cover you. Hmm. Wow. That is, man, that's so heartbreaking. You it know, is. We, now, we've allowed the, the news, system to be created. We, we have, and I have, I'm not a politician. I can't even imagine what you need to do to change this. But I do know that people can order these tests on their own and that there are alternative ways to get them. And there are doctors who will be more friendly to ordering the better tests that can give you valuable information, but they're more expensive. So how do you deal with that? I don't know. I just know the old tests aren't working. I can say the emperor's got no new is is naked, but I don't know how to dress him. I don't mm. know what we can do to fix it. Oh man, this is this is important. Again, this is tying in an important point that you know if we really just take a step back and look at how the system is constructed, and we see the political aspect, we see the the pharma pharmaceutical aspect that the pharmaceutical industry, which is again. This is a trillion dollar industry, multi-trillion dollar industry that's profiting from the farming of sick people. But then we've got to see the integration with insurance companies who are really kind of the Goliath in all of this. Yeah, there are five big ones and they control all of it. They yeah. really do. Um, I, you know, when we talk about big pharma, it's very easy to make them the bad guys because they are most of the time. Um, I did a tiny little bit of research before coming on last night. Just, just look at how much Big Pharma has paid in fines? Wait, wait, it gets better? For either lying outright, for mismarketing, for encouraging doctors to use it off-label, which is just like, hey, I know it's not authorized for this, but you know, a lot of patients are telling us it grows hair. You might want to try that. You know, they can do all of that, right? Here, so I just took a little sample of 2004 to 2012. A random eight-year sample, $17 billion for those eight years. And that's every one of them, Pfizer, Merck, every, Johnson & Johnson, $17 billion. So over eight years, that's over $2 billion a year. Go back to the 80s and go to now and think of the number of billions of dollars they've gotten in fines for lying and misrepresenting their products and concealing safety data, right? And now think of the phenomena that for the last two years we've said, oh no, these guys don't lie, they want to save the world. They have no money motivations, and we can't, if you even ask about their motivations or about their financial interest in this policy, you are, you're, you're, you know, and you're going to be deplatformed and, and demonetized from YouTube. So I, I don't understand how knowing this and having seen this in the cholesterol playbook for 25 years, yeah. And I've seen in other playbooks. I mean, Vioxx was a great example. People died because of Vioxx. And that's all... Forty to 60,000 Americans died. Because of Vioxx. Yes. Because they concealed heart disease, uh, heart attacks in the, in the group that was tested on. We suddenly thought they're all Mother Teresa. They're all... Oh, they would never lie about the vaccine safety. Never. How could they do it? What are you talking about? Yeah. It's the same people. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know we don't want to get into all of that, but the point is it, this industry is, is not our friend. They're not out there going, how can we make the world healthier? How can we prevent heart disease? Lowering cholesterol is not the same thing as lowering heart disease. That's a take home. <laughs> yeah. You, you're lowering a lab value. That lab value does not summarize your risks, Sean's risks, Johnny's risks for having an event, for having heart disease, or for dying early. It doesn't. It's one single lab value taken out of context. Why is there so much attention on it? Because we can change that lab value. $31 billion a year is spent on changing that lab value. It doesn't prevent heart disease, and it doesn't extend your life. You brought up those mortality figures. That's just one study like that. There are many yeah. that look at, here's the control group, here's the statin group. Let's see what happens. Oh, we had two less deaths from heart disease in the statin group. That's great. Let's just tell them about that. But, oh, wait, you had two more deaths in the control group for this, and the statin group had two more deaths from cancer? Oh, well, let's not talk about that. Let's just say we saved two deaths from heart disease. As John Abramson once said, you know what? Dying from another disease is not success in terms of if, if treatment for one disease is the death from another, and it's not really a right. great result, right? Exactly, exactly. Wow, thank you so much for sharing this because it's a logical fallacy that we're carrying. If we don't first come from the perspective of this industry itself is really built on <sighs> the medicalizing just basic human function and emotion, right? So medicalizing our emotions, medicalizing um, our symptoms versus actually removing the cause of these diseases and basically farming sick people. It needs that, it requires that for its robust performance, right? We've got to get that piece and the fact, when you just mentioned those fines over that span of time, those are just the things they got caught for. We're just talking about we're talking for. about billions of dollars every single year for fraud, for killing business. people, for it's... lying, for for go bribing government officials. The list goes on and on and on. These are the things they get caught for, but we're missing out on the things. Number one, that they have found a way to finesse, but also, even with those fines, Johnny, you know this. That is nothing to them. They account for that this is, because if they can profit $10 billion and pay a $1 billion fine, guess what? We made $9 billion. So this gets us to this point here, which is you, we mentioned a little bit earlier the significant increased risk of cognitive decline, but also diabetes. This was published in Current Diabetes Reports. It's a direct quote. Statin therapy increases the risk of diabetes by 9 to 12% in the two meta-analysis of statin trials themselves. And by 18 to 99% increased risk of developing diabetes on a statin in five population based studies. Statin therapy impairs insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion based on clinical and epidemiological studies. Well, if we get into insulin resistance, we're going to be here for several hours because this is my passion. Um, should we just do a quick Thing of what that is and why it's important. Yes, please. Yeah. All right. So, insulin resistance is the great metabolic plague of the 21st century. 88% of Americans have some degree of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance underlies every chronic disease we know of, starting with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease. And when I, when the the pandemic was going on, I was noticing, wow. Insulin resistance underlines like half the comorbidities. What about the other three, the liver, lung, and, and kidney ones? And I did about a morning's worth of research on, the, on PubMed, the National Institute of Health Library, to see what the, resist, the, the connection between insulin resistance and these other things was. Every one of them is statistically related to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the, are the termites in your body that are just destroying the structure, and you just wait for the house to fall down. And most doctors don't see the signs till the walls are crumbling. But you can see insulin resistance. You can test for it 10 years before your doctor says, your blood sugar is really going up. And that A1C is not looking so good. Wait, blood pressure is really high. I mean, your cholesterol is through the roof. That's late stage stuff. It starts with insulin resistance. And I'll explain what insulin resistance is. But the point to know is that it is a dysfunction in how we metabolize carbohydrates. And it exists, it's endemic in the population. And it leads to everything bad. And 
if we had one message in the great cholesterol myth, Steve Sinatra and I, in, in the revised version, it's that this is what we should be looking at, not LDL cholesterol. We should be looking at, ins at markers for insulin resistance, which, by the way, is just a technical name for prediabetes. So we, everybody knows there is such a thing as prediabetes. That's prediabetes. And guess what, Sean? Diabetes is preheart disease. So this is one long metabolic continuum, and it starts with that. And that's why I talked about it in Living Low Carb, and then we talked about it, in, and as we saw the research that came in since the 1970s that has linked this that nobody talks about, because it's so easy to lower LDL cholesterol, but it ain't so easy to lower insulin resistance with, without um, using things that doctors don't tend to use, like diet and fasting and improved sleep. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. So just to specify, vegetable oil is not coming from peas and carrots. It's coming from seeds, actually. So some people call it seed oil. And there's eight of them that I recommend everyone just get out of their diet.